Jesus loves the sinner who but Jesus calls him friend reaches out to touch the leper bids the weary come to him who but Jesus loves the lowly those the world has cast aside and with such scandalous compassion makes a wretch his chosen bride. Who but Jesus dwelt among us, called this broken world his home, took on flesh and pain and sorrow, reaping what he did not sow. With the shared salvation with the thief he shared a cross all that we might share his riches who but Christ would give it all who but Jesus who but Jesus Jesus loves the sinner enough to give his life love to pure for men to merit grace to glorious to deny praise him now with joy in living as in death my comfort rest in that Jesus loves Powerful message right there. Who but Jesus? Just a, a couple thoughts before we begin our message this morning. Uh, trust last week's presentation by Carl Kirby was very appreciated by many. I got a lot of good comments and certainly appreciate his coming and uh, ministering with us on Sunday. And then also uh, he was able to be with us on Monday in our school uh, re enrollment, and he did a wonderful job there. And then uh, just excited about two weeks from today, we will be having our 60th annual missions conference. We're 60 years old, but we didn't have the missions conference that first year. They had a lot of uh, growing uh, pains and uh, so forth, meeting in a public school. But that very first full year, they started the missions conference. And we have been doing that ever since. And right around this time of the year, uh, uh, we have been hosting it, and it always proves to be a wonderful highlight of our calendar year. And I hope you are getting ready for it. And as Pastor Marcus shared, we do have a couple uh, nights still remaining. If you can see Pastor Garcia, he can tell you those dates. But uh, it's a wonderful opportunity. You can team up with maybe another family and just a chance to, to get to know uh, some of these uh, missionaries. And I know it would be an encouragement and a blessing. We're looking in John chapter 15. In just a moment, I want to show you a video, and it's in German. But you don't need to know German to get the point. There's this young woman that asked her father how he likes the new iPad that she gave him for his birthday. Watch it, and you'll get the point. 
wish we would have had to play the German. Maybe some of you know German here would have been able to get it even a little bit better, but uh, we didn't use the sound there on that. Anyway, you can see how horrified she was of a $1,000 iPad being used as a chopping block. But in real life, folks, it's not a laughing matter when you see something very costly not being used to fulfill its purpose, its intended purpose. Or even worse, being used for something contrary to the purpose that it was designed for. There are churches across our land that are no longer churches. And one day they were thriving, they were strong, they were built well. But today they've closed their doors. Some of them are serving as museums, clinics. In fact, we have one that used to be right down Bird Road across from Denny's that was there for years. I think it was Bird Road Baptist Church. It's a bicycle shop. What's happened across our land? More and more people are not fulfilling the purpose that God has called us. It should never happen. We should be thriving. We should be experiencing more. Experiencing uh, more fruit. Uh, as you'll see in our thoughts this morning. The saddest thing of all is when people who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ fail to live to the fullest of the purpose that God has intended you to live after he saved you. What we see is they drift through life like unredeemed people, living to accumulate more stuff, more things, and they think that they will make them happier before they die. But they never stop to consider what God wants them to do. With the few precious years that God gives us these gifts that he gives us here on earth that he has for us. He wants us to use our gifts for him and honor him. I think they're having problems of getting it up. Uh, I can see uh, Jack or Jonas, you want to take this back there? And Oh, there you go. It's up. Okay. Uh, I was going to give him a UPS drive and to help him get it going, but it looks like we have it. Just before John chapter 15, the last verse of chapter 14 tells us the scene. Je Jesus had been... She needs it just in case. Okay. Thank you. The last verse there says, but the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me the commandments, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. You see, the night before Jesus had spent, prior to going to the cross with his disciples in the upper room in Jerusalem, he was instituting the Lord's Supper that we as a church observe on many, many occasions. That we follow through and uh, utilize in, in, in our walk, in our life for him. The Lord's Supper, Jesus had just washed the feet of the disciples. He had led them through a final meal. He shared that meal with them and then following, he would be leaving and walking down to the Garden of Gethsemane. And on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane, you remember that would be his great highly priest and he would be asking the Lord if he could remove that cup from him and he was about to go on the cross. But I can only imagine as they walked from the upper room back to the garden of, uh, and to take those disciples that along the way Jesus saw a garden, a grapevine. And he took the time to teach an important principle. You see, during that time of the year, right around April or so, that's when the blooms are blossoming on the grapevine. And he took one of those branches and he held it and he gave a valuable lesson that they would never, ever forget. A lesson that they would take with them for the rest of their lives. And he says, we need to have a fruitful life. Understand what God himself would do to make it happen. He would go through the crucifixion. But it was his desire that you and I would bear fruit, that we would be used for our intended purpose, for what God has called us here to do. Professor Dr. Howard Hendricks, a longtime professor now in glory, 
at Dallas Theological Seminary, had been on a long road trip. And when he returned home, one of his children wanted him to see how much she had grown while he was away. He was only away about three weeks, but she was so excited. She had some growth spurts there, and uh, sure enough, they get the chart out, and they measure her. Sure enough, she had grown one-tenth of a millimeter. That little child said, Daddy, I'm so excited, but I have a question. Why don't big people grow? Why did they stop growing? Well, we understand that as physically speaking, and we deal that in the physical realm, but it's worth our time to reflect that in the spiritual realm. Why aren't we growing? Why aren't we becoming more mature the longer that the Lord gives us here on earth? That's what God intended us to do, to be more like him. Growth comes from a source, and the source is Jesus Christ. We're to abide in him. The bountiful fruit depends upon your relationship with the vine, the branch and the vine. And if we're not attached properly, if we're not getting the right nutrients, if we're not spending time in God's word, it's going to be a little difficult for us to grow. It's impossible for the branch to become effective because we're not in line and abiding in him. I want us to look one more time, those passages, we read them, but I think it, it would serve purpose for us to look at them this morning where we read, I am the true vine, Jesus, and my father is the the husbandman, the gardener. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Then he says, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. He goes on in verse five, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, and there it is, if you're gonna expect to produce fruit, spiritual Christians, we must abide in him. You can't do anything. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. And if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples, shall we pray. Father, is these next few minutes that we could just be still and understand and know one of the last lessons that you gave your disciples is written down for us to learn today. Lord, we understand we're intended after we come to know you as our Savior to have a purpose in our relationship to this world and our relationship to you. Help us to bear fruit in our relationship as we grow closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are full of parables. We study them. They're awesome. They're great. There's some great practical principles there. We learn from parables. But John goes about it a little different way. He presents to us analogies. And in our passage that we've just read, the analogy is of a vineyard. And Jesus is telling us, number one, that he is the vine. Chapter 1 of, or chapter 15, verse 1, it says, I am the true vine. Jesus is the vine. As you think about it this morning, these five simple word pictures, he's the true vine. When Jesus says he's the vine, he's using that image that he's very familiar with to the followers of that day because many of them were gardeners. I've never really planted a, a, a grape vineyard, never had the opportunity, and I don't think they really do well here in South Florida in the heavy, heavy heat, and sometimes cool days. I understand in California, it's very good. But uh, I worked when I was in college in uh, 
little town in Georgia that I worked for a landscaping company. It was the carpet capital of the world. And uh, the landscaping had millionaires that used our services because they owned these carpet companies. And we would work on some of the properties and they would have these huge vines uh, that were there. And during a certain time of the year, they were just a vine. No branches at all. They would completely cut them back. And I says, how are they going to get grapes out of that? And sure enough, as summer came and so forth and all, I started seeing some of the fruit of what the labors of those people that worked in those vineyards. And got to sample some of those grapes that were growing on those vineyard trees. Jesus says, I am the vine. And without the vine, no fruit could ever result. We could never have fruit. You see, branches are utterly dependent upon that vine. If the vine was gone, those branches are not going to be able to do anything. Folks, without the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no spiritual hope. There is no spiritual life. There is no eternal world. Throughout the Old Testament, Jesus, or the Old Testament prophets and, and scriptures referred often to grape vineyards. And, uh, in Isaiah chapter 5, we, we, we see Israel is referred to this God's vine that he planted. And, and it became a national symbol that was on some of their coins. You would find their coins that had the, the grapevine on it. That's what they were called. There was a golden vine over the entrance to the temple. And so the prophet in Isaiah paints that picture in chapter 5 of the Lord planting a vineyard and expecting to find good grapes as the harvest. But it only produced worthless grapes, bitter grapes. As a result, the Lord threatened to destroy the vine, the vineyard, because it did not fulfill its intended purpose. If we had time, uh, we could take and and look at a dozen of those passages in the Old Testament, but I think that one right there in Isaiah chapter 5 kind of sets the tone. Jesus is telling us that he is the vine. And without him, we can do nothing. Then we see the second aspect of our, our passage here. Not only is he the uh, vine, but he's also the, the gardener. We see that he refers to his... Heavenly Father is the gardener. The gardener is God, the Father. He is the one in charge of the vines. He is the one in charge to whom ultimately accountability to be rendered. He does everything that is within his power to, to see that the plant bears fruit. The gardener has a very important role. The Heavenly Father has an important role to make sure we are living our purpose and doing what we're supposed to be doing. You know, the Bible gives us many ways of looking at our relationship with the Lord. In the uh, thought, he is the king and we are the servants. Uh, he is the shepherd, we're the sheep. He is the light and we are the reflectors of the light. He is the father and we are the children. And here in John chapter 15, he is the vine, we're the branches. We're his branches. And as a branch, we have a purpose to be fulfilled. It's a fresh way of looking at God. He is the gardener and we are the plants. I'm not a good gardener. My father-in-law was an excellent gardener. I've tried a number of times digging up my backyard and making spots to plant tomatoes. I enjoy eating tomatoes, but I'm terrible at it. I'm, for some reason, the bugs here just tear them up. After I get them to a certain point, all of a sudden I see the worms eat my tomato. I said, what are you guys doing? I spent hours and hours trying to get those tomatoes on my vine. And I find every, I go to the garden and say, what do I do? I'd spray that powder on it and it still didn't work. But oh, there's good gardeners. There's those that know how to tend to the crop and give it the right nourishment. God is the original gardeners, folks. He knows what he's doing. He began by planting the Garden of Eden. You remember where Adam and Eve got their beginnings and their start. What a, I, I wish I could have been there. A perfect place. No weeds. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, I, I commented to one of our members here. I says, your yard looks so great. How do you do it? And he gives me all the secrets. And I said, why do the same thing? And it's, I get these weeds growing up. And I put the weed stuff. You know, the original gardener, our father, he knows what he's doing. 
He knows what he's doing with each one of us. He is performing. He's doing well. He's the master gardener. And I'm so thankful we have a God who tends to care for us and make sure we're okay. And make sure we're along the way and that we do what is right. He wants us to grow, folks. He wants us to develop and mature in our walk with the Lord. He wants us to be more like Him. And He wants to cultivate us and to make us fruitful. Well, there's a, a third analogy that I want you to refer to that you can look at this morning. It's not just the, uh, the vine and the gardener, but I want you to look at the dead branches that we see there in our passage. He, he says in the passage here that uh, the third element in that he is not using these branches. He says in verse 2, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. The gardener's role is to cut and prune the branches. I remember again when I was in college, I had to take a speech class and every person just about in college should take a speech class because it's very helpful, but boy, they really run you through the loops they're trying to do it. I said, what am I going to teach? Well, studying in the ministry, I said, I know a perfect passage to do. And I'm working in the landscaping place. I'll get a couple of the bushes there and I'll use this as an illustration. I'll use John chapter 15. And, and, and I brought my clippers and I brought a couple of uh, hedges and I brought them and I sat them down. I said, now in order for these things to shape and to go right, they have to be trimmed right. And, and I started pruning away and I'm clipping off and so forth and on. I said, that's the same way our Heavenly Father does with us. Sometimes he's got to cut. He, sometimes he's got to remove things. The dead branches. Uh, if a man abides not in me, the Bible says in verse 6, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men, men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Just a, a little bit earlier, they had just experienced Judas betraying and given the sob. You know, there are some people that act like branches. They got the spiritual head knowledge. They come to church, but they've never had a relationship, a heart relationship with the Lord. And Jesus is saying there are some dead, dead, dead branches that there's nothing, there's no life at all in them. They're not related. There's no relationship. And so as you think of this passage, there's really two thoughts. The, the dead branches are those that don't know the Lord in verse 2. Every branch of me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And then verse 6, but if there's one in me, he is cast forth as a branch and he's withered if he's not in me. Sad, but sometimes people will come to this church and sit and listen just as we're doing this morning to God's word. But all they have is knowledge. They believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They believe that he died on a cross, but they've never accepted him as their Savior. I was in that lot. Man, up to the age of 12 years old, I went to Sunday school. I went to church. I sat in the pew, and uh, I listened, but I didn't know him. But man, when I knew him, I knew the author of the book now. And it brought on a whole different meaning. And that's what Jesus is referring to. And when he talks about the different, there's a fourth analogy that I want you to look at here with me, if you would. Not only do we see the dead branches, but we see the living branches. When you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the living branches became a part of you. You are hooked to the vine. You become like the branches connected to the vine in God the Father is your heavenly father and he's in charge of cultivating the crop that you are to produce and yes many of the image of Christ and the believer are given in scripture that emphasize the importance of the union and communion there in 1st Corinthians 12 we have the body and its members you know this body is important but if I didn't have my hands and I didn't have my ears and I didn't have my eyes the body really wouldn't serve the purpose that it was intended for. And if part of it is not used, I don't use the best part. So he uses one uh, illustration. And then we see in Ephesians chapter 5, the bride and the bridegroom. 
What a beautiful, beautiful picture of that union and communion that we have with the Heavenly Father and the bride and the bridegroom. And then in John chapter 10, Jesus talks about the sheep and the shepherd. What a union that we have here. A member of the body cut from the body would die. The, the marriage creates a union, but it takes daily love and devotion to maintain that communion. The shepherd brings the sheep into the flock, but the sheep must follow the shepherd in order to have protection and provision. The sooner we as believers discover that we're not branches, the better we relate to the Lord. The sooner we see that, for we know our own weaknesses and confess our need for his strength. In John chapter 15, while every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be more fruitful. Prunes, fruitful branches. You know that word to prune? It means to make clean. And God prunes us. He forgives us. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness or which stops us from really bearing fruit, the disease. For branches that are born again, God promises to prune them. Dead wood for a believer is worse than fruitlessness. For dead wood could harbor disease, decay, and the gardener ensures that the Christian bear fruit by removing sometimes the sin in our lives from those branches, sinful habits have to be stripped away if we're going to be fruitful. Priorities, values need to be changed so that we can have the right Christian allegiance to our Heavenly Father and it aligns us to the glory of Him. You see, when God prefers the removal of sin to be the gentle process of either changing our life, circumstances, or encouraging us to repent, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. Yet often that pruning process can be very painful because it involves sometimes discipline. In Hebrews chapter 12, we read in verse 6, the Lord disciplines those whom he loves. And sometimes it's necessary, sometimes it's very important that you and I go through that process, the pruning. You may be thinking there isn't a whole lot of fruit on our branches this morning. You may be looking at it, and the point is, however, you do have some. And the Father will prune you and, and cleanse you and get you right with Him so that you can be more productive, that you can be more effective for Him. Pruning, pruning is cutting back the branch so it can consolidate its efforts to produce fruit. And yes, that cleansing process, God's pruning process, really isn't easy. God dealing with you and God dealing with me. And so... Sometimes we bring trials in our lives. And sometimes he brings tribulations to us. It's God's way of pruning us. It's God's way of making sure we have the right priorities going on. Peter, Peter chapter, 1 Peter chapter 4 reminds us that we can go through fiery trials. And it will happen. You know, sometimes as a Christian, we become barren running on fumes. We're empty. We're not close to him. I heard the story by Louis Palau that said this about an Air Canada air flight that ran into trouble on a Monday fateful night. You see, passengers were enjoying themselves sitting on that 747, excuse me, 767 jumbo jet. Only those without the earphones on, not watching the movie, felt it at first. Then there came a break in the movie. The pilot announced that flight 143 would be making an emergency landing. 69 people were trapped in an agonizing slow but an inescapable descent to earth. You could imagine being on that flight. You could imagine being one of those passengers not knowing what was going to happen. Everything that flashes through your mind in those few minutes. There was a desperate silence that was hung over the entire cabin. Fear gave way to screams as the landing neared. You see, all the latest technology couldn't keep that jumble jet in the air another second. You see, what had happened was this. That electronic, digital uh, gauge was out of order. 
You see, the flight crew depended on figures giving them the refueling crew how much fuel they needed. But someone on the fueling crew confused pounds for kilograms. And so when they got to the certain amount of kilograms or pounds, they thought that the plane had enough to make its trip to the certain location it was going. Where does this happen? That's happening a lot today. Fortunately, the captain and the co-captain were able to glide that jumbo 767 some hundred miles to a former military air base. And a dramatic crash landing heavily damaged the jumbo jet's landing gear. But by God's grace, those 69 people were all safe. All unhurt. An impressive craft headed into the right direction, but running on empty. And sometimes that's the case for us as Christians. We just go through the motions. We come to church. Oh, and we know we should read our Bible. And we read a passage very hurriedly because we've got a busy day and there's so much to do and so much to accomplish that we don't give the Lord its rightful place, that we don't keep him where he needs to be. It happens a lot today. We have a high sense of self-esteem and we're motivated, but then we wake up disillusioned, disheartened. The fuel has been spent. Where does the fuel we need for life come from? Jesus tells us it's from the Holy Spirit. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we depend upon him. And that leads us to the last thought here is the fruit. In verse 2, 4, 5, 8, and 16, we see this. It says, He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. There in those verses, we see about fruit. We see more fruit. We see much fruit. And then in verse 16, we see and the fruit that remains. What does it mean by fruit? What is the fruit of a Christian? What does God expect for us? What does he want from us as we go through life? What should our souls be producing? What is it that the Lord wants from us? It's abundantly clear from our passage in John chapter 15 that he does want us to be uh, fruitful. He expects us to be fruitful. Being fruitful is defining characteristics of the true Christian life. Well, how then do you and I bear fruit? How do we see this in our walk and our relationship? Well, verse 4 and 5 tells us that we will bear fruit when we learn to abide in Christ. Abide. There's that word. Our abiding in Christ appears over 10 times just in John chapter 15 alone. You see, our abiding in Christ involves our need to continually, first of all, be cleansed or clean. You can't abide with him if there's sin in your life. And therefore, the effect of producing fruit is not going to happen. But ev even when you and I fail to allow God to do the cleansing, it doesn't mean we've lost fellowship or no longer a part of the family of God and being able to part there. I heard about a child who dissipated his parents. He ran outside in the rain, like all kids love doing, and he got all muddy. Now, he didn't lose his family membership. He was still a son of the family. But they weren't immediately happy to invite him to sit down at the dining room table to have dinner. Go get clean. Until you get clean, you can't sit at this table. And that's exactly what Jesus is telling us. When there's sin in our life, it's impossible to abide. It's impossible to walk with him and to, to live for him. The ideal of already being cleansed or clean, clean is used earlier when Jesus washed their feet in chapter 13. Jesus said that they were already clean because they knew the Savior. But only their feet needed washing. They were dusty and dirty and muddy. We've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You don't have to keep getting saved. You're saved once and for all. But when sin comes in our life, it needs to be cleaned. 
It needs to be a prune. And we, we need God to, to do such a work in us. And we need for him to help us to do that. Paul said that Christ makes us holy through the washing of the water of his word. It's through his word that if we will continually be pruned and progress spiritually and attached to Jesus as those branches are attached to the vine, then we'll be able to have that abiding relationship. But it's then and only then that we can abide. Verse 4 says, abide in me. Verse 5 of John 15 says, he who abides in me and I in him. Verse 6 says, if anyone does not abide in me, Verse 7, it says, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Verse 9 says, abide in my love. Verse 10 says, abide in my love, just as I abide in my Father's love. Understand this, what does abiding mean? It means becoming closer to Christ. Closer to him, having that relationship to the Lord. God works through us by his Holy Spirit. Our role is simple please, and simply to abide, to remain in him. As you and I do this, as we give ourselves up, as we give up our independence and submit to his dependence in our lives, moment by moment, you and I make it possible for God to work through us and to do what? To produce fruit. To produce fruit so we can be able to be used for him. The key to the branch bearing fruit is having an uninterrupt, uninterrupted flow from the vine. We need those nutrients. We need God to be working and we need his power in our lives because every day is busy, folks. I have to tell you, I, I need him every day. And I have to tell you, I have an enemy that would love to trip me up. And if I'm not abiding, if I'm not close to him, I can drift. And if I can drift, I know every one of us in this room can drift. And you know what? It would suit the devil well to know that he's put you on the sidelines because he got you to give in to the temptation or the trial. How do we abide? Well, verse 10 says, if we love him, we keep his what? The commandments. We obey. Obey easy to remember, isn't it? Obey, abide, and we abound. If we obey and we stay close to him, abide, then we abound in fruit. We will produce much fruit in our walk and our relationship with him and live for him. Bearing more fruit, bearing more fruit doesn't come from trying harder. The world tries harder. It comes from getting closer getting closer in a relationship with the Lord, spending that time with Him. Yes, it's great that we take time to come and worship Him on Sunday, but you know, we need Him every day of the week. His power in our lives. Let me close with this thought here, three steps to obeying. There are three places in the Gospel of John where Jesus basically says, if you do this, then you're really my disciple. And what is it? Obviously, and it's a pretty huge statement because he's giving us some basic information on what a follower of his should look like. Obviously, these three things are not everything that we need to be doing. But if you do these things, you're on the right path toward obeying Jesus and therefore being able to bear more fruit. Look at the first one. Read the word of God. Take time in reading his word. John chapter 8 talks about that. To be able to obey, you have to know what Jesus actually said. To know what Jesus said. And how do we know what Jesus said? You have to read it. Some think the essence of Jesus' message was something generic like, mm, be nice. But Jesus' actual message to us is that you and I are to be radically counter cultural far from the accepted wisdom you're not going to stumble into it you've got to seek his wisdom so you can be that radical counter-cultural person that God wants you to be and how do you do it stay in his word there's just something about every day the new things that we learn from the word of God 
And I've been practicing for many, many years to read this book every year. And you know what? I didn't see that last time I read it. Maybe I did, but I didn't, it didn't glimpse at me. But, oh, it spoke to me today. Folks, I encourage you, spend daily time in the Word of God. Secondly, invest your life in people. With your time. With your love. And yes, with our money. He says, you know, you, you, you can't keep it. And, 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 and thankfully, many of you see that important principle with your time, with your love. Here the word love doesn't mean think nice, nice things towards people. But actually says, show your love in practical ways. This week I came back to the office and there was a gentleman that had rode from Homestead on his bicycle. He hadn't been around here in probably 10 or 12 years, 13 years maybe, and he was down and out. And he'd come every time, he'd ask, how's Pastor Kokenar doing? And he says, I'm coming to church when Pastor Kokenar comes at the end of the month of missions conference. But then he shared with me his down luck story, and he showed me a picture. He says, my son died 43 days ago. Before I even got here, he had already spoken to one or two of our, our people, and uh, Mr. Mendez says, Pastor, I think this is somebody we ought to help. Because, listen, I get unindated of people coming, asking all of us for help. But he says, and he doesn't normally say that, and he went and brought me one of the gift cards that we have on hand that we try to help people at times. And I uh, had to go back and get a little bit more because he needed it really a little bit more. But I heard a story. How do we show love? Now, I know we could be doing that because, I mean, I go to every corner in Miami and I see somebody out. I'll work for food. They really don't want to work. They just want our money. But sometimes there's real people that have genuine needs that we do invest in. And God says to love his people. And how do you win people to Christ? By loving them. And then thirdly, serve. As you serve, John 15, verse 8, we need to be actively serving in some particular way. I tell you, so many of you are so faithful and serving. We had our marriage conference on Friday and Saturday. It was great, and I'm sorry those of you that weren't able to attend. Uh, it was an amazing time. We enjoyed it tremendously, but you know, we had children that we had to help with families, and we had several that volunteered. So I'll be glad to help. They served. I had somebody come say, Pastor, if you need me to translate, there's somebody that comes that doesn't understand I'll be willing to try that's a long four hours of uh, marriage conference fortunately we didn't have anybody that needed that they were pretty well able to understand the speaker but folks God wants us to serve find ways to become active involved and doing things you need to be actively serving in a way if you don't know what your spiritual gift is guess what you'll find out by trial and error by just getting active and involved in doing we need to be doing, not just talking. Many years ago in Key Biscayne, there was a pastor who moved up to Orlando area, but his name was Pastor Steve Brown. I heard one of his illustrations I thought was a very interesting uh, illustration that I want to share with you. It was the story of a British soldier in the very first World War. He lost heart for the battle, and he started running, and he deserted. Trying to reach the coast for a boat to England that night, he ended up wandering in a pitch black dark night, hopelessly lost. In the darkness, he came across what he thought was a signpost. So he, in order to see it, he had to climb the pole so he could read it because it was so black and wasn't able to see what it said. As he reached the top of the pole, he struck a match to see, and he found himself looking squarely into the face of Jesus Christ. It was a cross. It was a highway cross. He realized that rather than running into the signpost, he had climbed on a roadside crucifix. Pastor Brown explained, then he remembered the one who had died for him, who had endured, who never turned back, who always moved forward. The next morning, the soldier was back in the trenches with his warriors. Folks, when you get tired, and I know we do, when you get afraid, and that happens, when you get discouraged, the best way I know how to get back into the battle of your life 
is to strike a match in the darkness and look into the face of Jesus Christ. He says, you love me. If you love me, keep my commandments. And then he says, without me, without me, you can do nothing. Father, we're grateful and thankful for a passage such as this that we find in Scripture this morning. A passage that reminds us and encourages us that we're to abide. We need that abiding. But Lord, we know in order to abide and be close to you, there's some pruning that needs to go on in our life. As a Christian, Lord, there might be some areas of our walk and our life that you're not happy with, are not pleasing to you. Sin that we need to deal with in our own heart and our life. And Lord, right where we sit, Lord, help us to confess those failures. Those things that we know are not right, but we have gotten a trap and a, a rut and we do them on an often pattern. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to be clean so that we can abide, that we can abound. And Lord, that's a desire, I believe, of every heart here this morning that we want to be fruitful Christians. Christians that are producing fruit in their lives. For we ask these things in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen.